Life's Progress Through the Passions was written later in Haywood's career. And it's also a little bit of a challenge to identify what genre this narrative is, because it's kind of like a novel, but it's also the history of an individual and a kind of philosophical analysis of the problem of emotion and one's emotions at different stages of, of life. So the narrator Haywood tells us that we're not going to have a, a main character who's perfect and maybe not even admirable. He's not really heroic. He's just ordinary and he makes mistakes and he has this balance of passions and he does things that are stupid and he does things that are inconsiderate and he gets those things out of his system and he ends up um, happy at the end, but he uh, kind of suffers a lot along the way. And he's some of it is his fault and some of it isn't. But he himself is not without is not without fault. So he comes from a family that's well off, but not super rich. His childhood is relatively happy, but it's kind of made unhappy by his father's new wife, who is not kind to him. So, so he doesn't have a perfect childhood. There's nothing perfect about him. The point of this narrative is to analyze the different emotions that people feel at different stages of their life. So it's kind of an argument about developmental psychology. And of course, you know, we get attached to Natura. It's interesting to watch him, but he doesn't have any outstanding qualities. He's not super evil. He's not super good. He's, he's supposed to be typical. And there isn't really a moral lesson either. There's really, if you look for one, it would be kind of hard to find one. It's really um, an analysis of emotion. So what's the analysis? Well, as it turns out, um, curiosity is one of the greatest gifts of nature. Um, all, but all commendable qualities can be perverted. So something like devotion is a good thing, religious devotion, but that can turn into enthusiasm if it's in, in the extreme. Um, love is a good thing, but it can become lust. Frugality is positive, but it become avarice. Emulation is good, but it can go wrong and become envy. Uh, courage can become rashness and um, curiosity can also become rashness. So, so Haywood sees emotion on what looks to be like a, a sliding scale. And um, although these emotions are part of our constitution, but we have to moderate them if we can. We can't always. We don't always choose to. But anyway, the point is that at different stages of life, these different emotions are more prominent. So in youth, love is the strongest passion. Emotions are latent in youth, but they gradually make their appearance. appearance. So you remember when he's a child, he doesn't really quite show much emotion yet, but then he meets Delia and some of his emotional possibilities start emerging. In the, in the ages, this is very specific, from 17 to 20, this is when errors are most excusable because you kind of have the body of an adult, but your brain hasn't caught up yet. And so um, this is where Natura makes a lot of big mistakes and he has a lot of um, extreme emotions and um, he travels and he meets the two nuns who are jealous of each other. Um, love is a very strong passion at that time and he falls in love um, many times and uh, you know, it kind of, it, sometimes it gets him in trouble, sometimes it doesn't. Usually he gets away with it, um, but he's often very vulnerable to falling in love. So, but as he, but as he gets older, he learns to moderate his passions a little bit. 
or he doesn't even learn to moderate them. They just kind of change and, into something else. So while love is a dominant passion in youth, as he enters, um, there's two phases of middle age in this novel, according to Haywood. As he enters the first phase of middle age, he's um, it's ambition that starts to take over. So he wants to accumulate money. He wants to be important. He wants to be admired. He wants to have accomplishments. And again, you know, ambition is um, not initially understood by him as anything bad. It's kind of what he's supposed to do. But then in the second part of middle age, he starts to realize, or he would tells us that um, ambition itself is revealed as nothing more than pride and envy and self-love. So, um, so he starts to soften and he, you know, has some disasters because his, he catches his brother with his wife and this is very upsetting to him and he's very angry. And this gives Haywood the opportunity to explain to us that anger is very strong in its initial appearance and then, and then it fades. But the thing that doesn't fade until it's satisfied is, is revenge. So he actually um, seeks to marry in revenge because if he marries and has children, then his estate goes to those children and none of it goes to his brother who runs away, by the way, to Gibraltar. So then the brother, the brother dies and he actually kind of feels bad about that. He never quite reconciles with his brother and he doesn't get his revenge. And so it's interesting because we're used to narratives in which there's kind of a, a movement towards a resolution, but nothing is ever really resolved in this novel. I'm not even sure we can call it a novel in this narrative. There isn't really a resolution. There's, um, he had, he had the emotion of revenge and it just fades because the brother, the brother dies. And so he, and, and so because of that, he doesn't have to marry the country girl anymore for, for revenge. So he actually acts with, um, with honor in that because he doesn't really want to marry her. And he kind of knows that she doesn't really want to marry him, except that this is like a big leap in stays for her. So he gives her father some money for her dowry so she can marry somebody else who she loves. And so, so it's fine. He hasn't really manipulated her feelings, but he was willing to have this marriage mostly to get revenge on his brother. So there's no point in that either. So when he gets older, his, all of his passions sort of soften and he isn't, doesn't have the turbulence of love and desire of youth. He doesn't really have the ambition anymore of early middle age. And it's only then that he can actually get in a relationship that begins as a friendship and goes on for a while as a friendship and only gradually turns, turns to love. And so then he, he marries Charlotte and they have children and he was healthy until he drank a glass of water that was too cold and it made him sick. And it just, the, just the kind of randomness of life, you know, car crash, cancer, any, any kind of thing. I mean, I know that the drinking a glass of water um, may, seem, may seem kind of silly to us because we don't think that will actually bring about death. But I think what you have to think about is that in, you know, in later life, lots of, in early life too, but more likely in later life, you know, any kind of small thing that maybe you would have managed in, you know, well in, in a youthful body is just going to lead to um, debility and people are fine until they're not. And that's what happened to Natura. And what's really fascinating to me about that is that there isn't really any reason for it. You know, he's not being punished for doing something wrong. He's not being rewarded 
there isn't really kind of like an overall, you know, message. It's just kind of, there's just a lot of randomness in his life. And I, and so Haywood's interest is not really in creating some kind of moral lesson, but in analyzing um, his emotional response to all these different phases and to suggest what the shape of a human life looks like. And to her, what it looks like is that it isn't really a story in the sense that there's a problem, there's a climax, there's a resolution. When you, when you see novels like that, they're like little bits of life, but then there's another, you know, conflict that emerges. And sometimes there isn't really a conflict except for his own, you know, sort of internal turbulence. And he has to overcome depression at a certain point. You know, she calls it melancholy. There's a long passage in kind of between the phases of early middle age and later in middle age, where he goes into a very long melancholy, uh, period of melancholy. So, so I think one thing that is interesting is that this narrative tracks pretty closely to what a lot of psychologists think now is the happiness trajectory of people, which is sort of a U shape where middle age is the nadir where people are, are less happy and they're happy in youth. And then they get less happy during those years of ambition that are revealed to be nothing. But then, then they get on the other side of that when they realize that all that ambition was only pride and self-love and, uh, there's, and there's greater happiness toward, toward the end of, end of life, which is sort of what, um, you can find that argument pretty readily in um, popular psychology. So I'm not saying that it's true, but I think um, I'm really interested in this narrative because it doesn't really seem to be aiming at becoming a novel. It seems to be really an analysis um, of emotion. And in fact, I would say it's, it's more like Eliza Haywood's philosophy of emotion as exemplified in a character and in some things that he faces. And so while you look at someone like Hobbes kind of writing straight up, you know, in a philosophical language, she's addressing philosophical concepts, but she does it through a, a single example. And she doesn't always do that. And I don't actually think the rash resolve is like that, but life's progress through the passions is, you know, literally what the title suggests is kind of a, um, an analysis of, um, of how various passions are experienced at different phases of life. And when you look back at both Hobbes and Descartes, one thing that you don't see there is a kind of is a suggestion that passions are different at different ages. So that may be Haywood's important innovation is to think about how, how age has to do with certain passions. And, and in that sense, it's Cartesian because it has to do with how the body changes with age. And, and that um, there's, there's, some, there's some Hobbes in, in this, but I think she's more returning to a Cartesian model of, um, of emotion.